and welcome to this absolutely marvelous event. I uh, feel thoroughly exhilarated and delighted uh, to introduce our actually very special guest uh, this evening, uh, namely Mr. Jordi Palou um, from Barcelona in Spain. Um, Mr. Palou's uh, history is quite extraordinary and indeed illustrious. So let me just um, illuminate you to some of his multifarious activities, because indeed they are multifarious and enormously distinguished and important. Um, uh, Jordi Pelou holds a uh, law degree and a master's in criminal law from the University of Barcelona. Uh, additionally, he has a master's degree in mediation and conflict resolution from the Ramon Lul uh, University of Barcelona. Uh, and he's currently working on his PhD. Uh, Jordi is also the co-director of an organization called Equitas, uh, which is a mediation and alternative uh, conflict resolution service, which provides um, resolution uh, services for a number of is uh, legal issues, including family law, criminal law, and other domestic and indeed international conflicts. Uh, Jordi is the lead attorney in the law firm, law firm of Palou and Rogni Associates. Uh, the firm specializes in family and criminal law, both national and international. Uh, Jordi teaches mediation, conflict resolution, and transitional uh, justice <coughs> at a variety of Spanish universities, including the Ramon Llull University, the Independent University of Barcelona, and the Balearic Islands University. He's a member of the Barcelona Bar and the Human Rights Institute of the International Bar Association. Um, he's also a member of the International Criminal Bar and is a lawyer at the International Criminal Court. Uh, Mr. Pelou has written extensively, publishing various articles and books in the areas of international law and mediation. Uh, more specifically, and particularly for <coughs> today's purposes, since 2001, uh, Jordi has assumed the legal representation of Catalan, Spanish, Rwandan, and Congolese victims in the conflict in Central, uh, uh, in Central Africa, as well as in the International <coughs> Forum for Truth and Justice in the African Great Lakes, uh, meeting with victims, relatives, uh, witnesses, and experts in Europe, Africa, the United States, and Canada. I'm absolutely delighted and very privileged to introduce Jordi Pelosi, we are very honored at the school by his visit, and we hope it's uh, the first of a good many, I hope, Jordi, <laughs> lovely to meet you. Thank so you, much. thank you thank very you. much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your presence, and thank you for your presentation, Professor Wester. I'm, in fact, the, the honor is mine uh, to be here, and I'm, I'm really very glad to have been invited by Weider um, School, by the Dean, and uh, Professor Peeler that uh, have, uh, in a way, made possible that I'm here with you uh, tonight. And um, <coughs> I hope, um, I know that you are very occupied, so I'll try to be as synthetic as possible knowing that, of course, what is more interesting for all of us is that you exchange, you participate, uh, and uh, whatever you might uh, find interesting. So please interrupt me anytime and uh, participate anytime that you might uh, find interesting to do it. Uh, I will try to talk about uh, the two uh, international initiatives that we're um, focusing on in Central Africa. <coughs> when I talk about uh, Central Africa, I talk about Rwanda, but I talk also about Democratic Republic of Congo. And um, I'll try to explain why. And the two legs and the two um, ways that uh, we are working and we are focused on are basically uh, a legal case that we brought before the Spanish courts um, in Madrid, uh, but according to international law and international crimes. 
So I'm going to focus on that my, the first part of my speech. And then, and coming from, from that initiative, a second initiative that focuses on international dialogue between uh, Rwandese, Hutu, Tutsi, and Twa, which are uh, the ethnic, main ethnic groups in Rwanda. So I'll try to um, at least give a framework of these two um, main uh, international initiatives so that you have uh, a, a close idea of what we are uh, trying to do all these years in, in, uh, in Central Africa. I assume that most of you know and uh, a, a little bit where uh, Rwanda uh, uh, is uh, in Central Africa, but just to have uh, uh, an idea of the difference between Rwanda and Congo, we can see here this little tiny country is Rwanda in Central Africa, <coughs> which capital is, is Kigali. Approximately, it's about 10 to 11 million people living in Rwanda right now. And uh, uh, <coughs> the main ethnic groups, I was, as I was saying, are Hutu, which are approximately 85%, or traditionally 85%. Tutsi, which are 14%, uh, and then Twa, which is approximately 1%. Um, the Twa uh, are the, uh, the original settlers of, of Rwanda, and the, they are pygmies, uh, just for you to have uh, an idea. But that, that is mainly. Of course, uh, there's a huge history uh, behind that um, of centuries that I cannot um, explain in two, in two minutes. But uh, in fact, when we are talking about Rwanda, most of the time, and many of you, I, I think uh, it's in the same way, uh, will remind about uh, what happened in Rwanda about what they called, or what it's called, the genocide, the genocide of Rwanda. This is mainly in year 94. And uh, as we were saying this, this morning, we, we did it uh, this morning also, um, if you Google or if you search in any of the sources, United Nations or even in the website of, of the Republic of Rwanda uh, or in other NGOs, international NGOs or institutions, mostly when we speak about you, what you can find about the genocide in Rwanda is the massive killings that took place in year 94. Uh, and in fact, they are referring more concretely to three months of year 94, from April to July of year 94. And uh, it is said in the United Nations, for instance, that uh, eight, um, 800,000 people were killed in these three months. If you go to the website of the Republic of Rwanda, you will find 930,000 uh, people. But between these numbers and one million people are considered to be uh, killed in these three months. And um, <coughs> what uh, this official version of the conflict says is that uh, mainly the main responsible of that killings were people 
who uh, were of the Hutu community or ethnic group uh, and specially linked with, at that moment, the government of Rwanda, at that moment, who was led by a military, uh, a military, because uh, he, he took power after a coup d'etat in the year 73. His name was uh, President Javier Imana, and he was, I was saying, Hutu. And uh, most of the victims are considered to be Tutsi or the ethnic group of, of uh, Tutsis. That was at the beginning, at the origin of the conflict. Uh, but later on, it, I think for the official version, it was too much to say that all victims were Tutsi. So they added and some moderate Hutus, which is, I, it's very in difficult or interesting to approach what is moderate Hutu. Um, we all understand what they, they were trying to say, but, uh, but in a way, it's very difficult. But if you go to the websites, uh, you'll see it like that. So that it's kind of a realistic category that um, became uh, reality. Uh, mostly, it makes reference to those who somehow uh, opposed Javier Imana regime uh, and were considered collaborators uh, of the Tutsi uh, rebels. That's in four words. I know it's too simply, and uh, when you do like that, it's not really complete, and it's not uh, exactly what what uh, what uh, it's stated. But in few words, what is the official version of that conflict and of that massive killings that took place in year ninety four? I just want to before going further, show uh, the country that we have here. Here we have uh, uh, Rwanda and Burundi, these, these lo two little <coughs> countries that we have here. And here we have uh, Kivu Lake. And all these is Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo, which occupies almost um, Western Europe. So it's huge. It's very, very big. Most of this central part is, is a, a, a forest, a very intense uh, forest. But just for you to have an idea and also a comparison of what is uh, the, the real situation. So when we come back to that point, because this is a key point, uh, and we try to understand what was going on, uh, by the way, sometimes when non-African people try to approach to that kind of conflict and try to understand that kind of a, a conflict, uh, they are said, please, it's not necessary to do it because this is a tribal uh, thing between ethnic groups that you might not understand. It's very old and it's very local and it's very... Uh, and depending on the situation, uh, some information circulates, and depending on what situa situation and what interest, uh, it's better that you don't interest yourself in that conflict. So uh, what I'm going to do right now is try to uh, give a complementary vision of that official version of, of, the, f the, of the conflict. <coughs> And I'll do that uh, from the approach that we had, and that will explain a little bit why we got into that conflict. In fact, uh, here we have a, a Spanish victim. called Joaquim Vallmajor, who was a priest, who was living there for more than 30 years. And this priest, to give you an example, 
was very active uh, trying to help Rwandese people, both Hutu and Tutsi mainly, also Twa, but especially Hutu and Tutsi, in the different violent conflicts that were, were uh, in, a, in a way executed in, in the country. But mainly, we could go far away in, in the past, but let's uh, uh, somehow uh, stop in when all this phenomenon or episode started, he was very active in from 1st October 90, where the war, this war, started. And in fact, when I say that this war started, I'm, I'm referring, we see here uh, Rwanda, we see in the north, we have Uganda, and here in Uganda, there were uh, some Rwandan sons and daughters of Rwandan refugees of the de decolonization process that were living here, that helped in that moment uh, to take power to Museveni in year 86, and were occupying key posts in the secret intelligence military services in Uganda in those years. And they asked to return back to their country. Most of them, they, 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 they were born in, in, in Rwanda or they were born outside Rwanda, but they wanted to go back uh, to their country and they were not allowed to do so. So they, they decided to invade the country in the first October 90. And in fact, they occupied all this area of the north of Rwanda. Not much people talk about this episode, which is very important to understand what, what happened in year 94. Imagine if uh, what happened, what would happen if uh, someone from the south of uh, Southern California invaded the south of uh, California for four years and fearing uh, mm, attacks at any moment uh, for four years and there, there would be uh, mm, violent attacks and contest uh, attacks between uh, the population and especially, and that in that case, that was between this military group, political military group called the Rwandan Patriotic Army and the army, the regular army of the government of Rwanda at that time, uh, led by uh, Javier Imana. I'm explaining that because that is a little bit the context to understand that. So there, was, there were massive killings in that period of, of time. A lot of losses of uh, lives, both Hutu and Tutsi. It started with... Uh, in fact, the invasion was done by the min minoritarian Tutsi, and so the victims were mainly Hutus, but then also, of course, th there were reactions from the Hutu uh, community against the Tutsi also, and so it was something uh, that continued all these four years. And here, in April, the sixth, there was a terrorist attack against the president of Rwanda and the president of Burundi. Uh, they were killed in a, uh, with a mi mi missile coming from Earth. And today, we don't know for sure who was the responsible of, of launching that m missile, which is really key for understanding what happened the days later. But what e almost everybody agrees is that this was uh, the main cause that culminated the tensions of four years that brought the people to kill themselves and to kill each other. Starting 
mainly uh, 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 from the Hutu community against the Tutsi minority, fearing uh, the Tutsi mm, uh, military group. Uh, but again, the official version remains on that. OK, so I'll try to come back to that, to that year, 94. But in fact, after this episode, this attack started, the genocide took place in these three months. And at the end of these three months, uh, this military Tutsi uh, political military group took power by force in July 94. The thing is what happened later on. And what happened in year 95, in year 96, and so on. Let's put 2002 and 2010. Why I, I explain that? Because, especially for your lawyer uh, perspective, I found interesting to outline that uh, after the Nuremberg Tribunal, the ad hoc tribunals that were statute by the international community after this uh, great experience of Nuremberg, which was the first experience as that, of course, not perfect, but it was uh, the first uh, mm, special uh, attempt to self-control the force of the winning uh, military forces, especially led by America. I have to say, it's very, very well known that especially the Russian uh, leaders wanted to kill the Nazi leaders as it was in the past for all the wars. The winners took the power, and then they eliminate uh, those who uh, lost the wars. That was the, the, the historical dynamic. So after the pressure of the United States, uh, it was like that, that uh, Nuremberg controlled, and somehow, the exercise of the force and, and the violence and say, OK, but that, let's do it well. Let's do it through a trial. And let's bring the opportunity to these people to the, this defend themselves with a lawyer. So after this experience, we had two experience, two international experience, which are, as you already know, the, the tribunal, international tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and the ICTR for Rwanda. This was studied in year 93 and this in year 94. So I invite you now very shortly, as I did this morning, just to get a look of the temporary competence of these tribunals that were studied by the Security Council a chapter seven of of the charter, so it, it, which is the use of force, precisely. And if we go to the statue of uh, of the court of Yugoslavia, we see here, having been established by the Security Council, you see it. You can see it, more or less, uh, I read it. Acting under Chapter 7 of the Charter of the United Nations, the International Tribunal for the Prosecution of Persons Responsible for Serious Violations of International Humanitarian Law committed in the territory of the former Yugoslavia since year 1991, uh, here and after referred the International Tribunal, shall function in accordance with the provisions of the present statute. And this is established also in Article 1. Terry, uh, violations of international humanitarian law committed in territory of the former Yugoslavia since year 91. So as you see, there is 
an original limit, temporary limit, but there is no end in the limit, in the temporary. Now if we compare that with the ICTR statue, we see some interesting differences. There are another ones, but at least we concentrate in this temporary, at least to have this, uh, this idea. And it says, also acting under Chapter 7 of the Charter of United S Nations, we see another temporary competence. And we see hereby having received the request of governor, government of Rwanda, I have to remember that the government of Rwanda took violently, sorry, took violently the power in July, year 94, for a concrete interest with a concrete purpose. But this government that took power, power violently asked the United Nations to establish an international tribunal for the sole purpose of prosecuting persons responsible for genocide and other serious violations of international humanitarian law committed in the territory of Rwanda and Rwandan citizens responsible for genocide and other such violations. And there we go. Committed in the terri territory of neighboring states between 1st January 94 and 31st December 94. So, the Security Council is deciding by law in a political vision, as a political decision, that they were not interested as a court to know what happened before, who started the war, and what happened during these four years, and were not interested what happened later on. I have to say that the, the court started, the first uh, feelings were in, in year 97. And there were many things that happened before year 94 and after year 94. So this has, I was just wanted to, to show you that, because this has a legal and also political meaning. Just to limit the mandate, because they were not interested in other uh, kind of um, investigation. So what I will try to do now, I was just doing this um, uh, introduction just for you to have a, a, an approximate idea of how all this started and how this was studied and how we got in that conflict and in, in that process and why. As I was saying, there was here a Spanish victim. As you see, in the middle of the temporary competence of the court. This was 26 April 94. But he was not the only one. This person and his family were living not more than 100 miles away from my home. And we had uh, some friends and some uh, relatives, close uh, relatives. Later on, there were four married brothers, again religious people, that were killed not in Rwanda, but in Democratic Republic of Congo. If we go again to the map, just to show you, Well, I could um, show you better the, only, the, the other map, which is, this allows me to, OK. Uh, they were here in Bukavu. You see Bukavu here? Um, Bukavu here. They were here in Bukavu, close to the border of Rwanda. What happened after the genocide, this 
massive killings in, in year 94, that most of, of the people of Rwanda, mainly of Hutu community after the Tutsi minority took power, left the country, fearing that they were being killed uh, again. So they went to most of these countries around, Congo, Tanzania, um, uh, cent uh, Central African Republic, Zambia, uh, Angola. Most of them went there. And a large number of them were located just in the border in refugee camps. There were more than a million and a half people. Imagine a million and a half is, is the whole population of Barcelona moving to another country and living every day. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, diseases, and whatever. Imagine this humanitarian catastrophe uh, after the massive killings of, of year 94. So they were here in that area. And these Marists were placed in Vukavu, very near uh, a, a refugee camp uh, that had 300,000 uh, refugees in, in, in there. And in year 96, I'm not explaining every detail because the events continued here in Rwanda and there was a, a, a difficult situation after uh, the Rwandan Patriotic Army took power in, in, in year 94. The struggles continued in year 94 and year 95. I will explain a little bit later on. But in year 96, the Rwandan Patriotic Army and the Rwandan Patriotic Front decided to bomb the refugee camps. They were saying that they were risking the security or whatever, and they were bombing with tanks with m massive armament um, uh, to the camps. And the Marist, uh, this religious, Spanish religious, uh, were one of the last people to leave um, the refugees. United Nations has, have left, uh, the PAM have left, um, the other organizations have left. So they, they decided to be with the refugees. And they were uh, launching an SOS International outside Congo and outside Rwanda saying, please, they're bombing these people. All the help they need, uh, because th they wanted some uh, international aid uh, organizations wanted to help the, the, the religious people to go out. And they said, if you are sending a, a plane, please send it to the people, not for us. We're going to remain here. So this was something that was followed also by the secret services. They were fearing that this information went out of the area. Uh, of the area and that's why they were also uh, killed uh, with a lot of, um, of many, many hundreds of refugees here. And then still here, we have three other Spanish victims, NGOs, um, Doctors of the World. You have it here, this organization in, in the States. It was a, a, a doctor, uh, Doctors of the World. It was a, a doctor, a nurse, and a journalist who were working in the northern, in the northern part of Rwanda, in this area which, as you see, touches the Lake Kivu. Here is where uh, the, the marriage were, and these people were working here. Of course, the people that were leaving the country living, were using these two axes. And at that point, uh, these people were also killed because they were assisting the civil population in Rwanda, which uh, in a way, it forced to uh, retrieve the international observations, the UN agencies and the uh, international NGOs that were placed all over 
the northwest part of, of uh, Rwanda, as we uh, inquired later. And to end with that, uh, here in year 2000, we have another priest of the Basque country, which was killed also in Rwanda, um, and uh, in the mouth, with a bullet in the mouth, which was really clear uh, uh, the message. But in between, there were a lot of Rwandese people killed in Rwanda out of year 94. And from here, we have, it's very long to, I, I know it's very complex, but I needed to enter it that way to explain a little bit what we are trying to do. This was the first war in Congo. This means that the Rwanda Patriotic Army, as I was saying, when they were bombing in October 96, the, the refugee camps, uh, they decided to invade the country. Imagine a little, a little country like Rwanda invading in no more than nine months a whole state like the Democratic Republic of Congo. The common sense says that they, they were uh, uh, together with someone that helped them. Uh, this happened in, in year 96. But in year uh, 98, most of these Rwandan people that were placed and helped Kabila to take power, which was no, the new president of Congo, uh, decided to, uh, Kabila decided to um, invite them to return to Rwanda. It was an invitation, let's say like that, but it was not really an invitation. So uh, this R Rwandan Patriotic Army decided to go back in one month and invade a second time the Democratic Republic of Congo. And uh, I have to say that in these movements, a lot of civil population of the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, Congolese people, were killed in, in between. And uh, it's very diffic difficult to know exactly the number, but people say that directly or indirectly uh, from that uh, violent conflict in those years, more than five million people have dead. More than ma five million people have dead. So, in a way, we had these people that were killed in, in Spain, and especially the first victim, that they wanted to know what happened to the relatives. For the first victim, they even didn't uh, find the body. It's a disappeared person. So they don't know what happened. They don't know where his or her relative is. And they were wondering. That's why we, in a way, started uh, to investigate. They asked us if it was possible to know what happened. Um, and of course, we said uh, it's not easy to know. You know how difficult sometimes is an investigation of murder uh, in our neighborhood. So imagine a thousand of kilometers away. But we said, well, we, 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 we have no answer today. So why, what if, if we try? So we contacted with all these victims. And all of them were interested to do something. And that's uh, why we uh, thought about the idea of starting an investigation. And from that idea, we started that investigation. And uh, we arrived at the end to file a lawsuit. And uh, as I explained a little bit yesterday in my presentation of yesterday, uh, and this is something different to your common law system. In, in the Romano-Germanico system, uh, there is the possibility that a lawyer, an attorney, represents in before court some victims. This means that this lawyer, this attorney, is defending the victim and at the same time is accusing the alleged responsible. 
So it's kind of, for us to understand, a private prosecutor. Hmm? And in that case, just for you to understand, uh, so in our system we will have the judge, we would have the state prosecutor, at national level and then we have what we call accusación particular which is private accusation in that case uh, let's say victim of law, uh, defense defense of victims in that case, for you to, uh, to understand, I'm at the same time representing legally the nine families of the nine Spanish victims, so victims directly, all the relatives, brothers and sisters, father, mother, or whatever, nine. And I'm also representing some Hutu, and Tutsi victims that were killed in between in that different moments that somehow are linked to the killings of the Spanish people. And I'm going to give you an example because sometimes people might say that we are against Tutsi uh, community because we are prosecuting the military political uh, movement that took power by force in, in Rwanda. But uh, I'm going to give you a completely different example. In, before July 94, some three bishops and nine religious people were killed, and among them, a little children, who was eight year old, was in the hands of one of the bishops. There were bishops Hutu and Tutsi. And this, this little child was also uh, killed, and it was a Tutsi. Uh, child. So I am representing uh, his mother uh, before court also. So nine Spanish victims, Hutu and Tutsi victims, and then some NGOs and personalities. I'm going to show you, just for you, uh, you might be interested to see that, uh, the lawsuit as we presented that into the court. This is in Spanish. The other documents I would uh, uh, show you in English also, but this is, uh, the lawsuit was of course presented in, in Spanish. So this is the lawsuit ha as it was presented and you see here the identification of the plaintiffs and here you see the brothers and sisters of Bain Major, which was the first priest, and then the other, this is the nurse, this is the journalist, this is uh, the doctor, all brothers and sisters or, uh, or even um, daughters, uh, and brothers and sisters of the Marist or the other, uh, the other missionaries. And then here we find uh, five, what we call protected witnesses, that survived specially the massive killings of Democratic Republic of Congo when the camps were bombed. Some of them, one of, of these, uh, for instance, uh, was escaping in foot, walking 2,000 kilometers from Vukavu, which is the city where the Marist were killed, to the other extreme of Congo, uh, almost in Congo Brazzaville. So uh, fearing every time to be killed because the military were um, uh, mm, attacking at every moment uh, the positions of the refugees. And here, some s survived to that uh, killings and were interested 
to be present in the procedure, as well as be witnesses, because they, they have also been witnesses of the killings of other uh, brothers and sisters. And here we have some um, uh, NGOs. Here we have, for instance, uh, the Peace Nobel Prize of Argentina, which survived uh, the death uh, flights of the uh, Argentinian dictatorship uh, in, 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 uh, in the 70s. And he, he, he's an activist for peace and justice, and he wanted to be present in the lawsuit, and he was allowed. And an American citizen, Cynthia McKinney, who was a congresswoman in Congress uh, representing uh, Georgia, May, maybe some of you know her. It's a brave uh, woman. And he was, she was uh, uh, sent by then President Clinton to the Great Lakes region just before Kabila took power, so during that struggle of year 96. And we have a lot of other associations in Belgium, in the States, in Canada, who are uh, present in that, uh, in that lawsuit. And at the end, we have also some even public institutions. So I am also representing public institutions, mainly the city towns where the Spanish people were killed. And this is in the, in the general interest of justice, that they want to be present, representing the people of the town, knowing that because there were most of them little villages, not very, well, Sevilla is not little, and, and it's also represented by me, but uh, in, and somehow this was really followed by the population, and the people were worried what happened and, and were, in a way, affected. When we are speaking about, if we interpret that literally, when we're speaking about crimes against humanity, this means that this affects humanity and us all, you and us all, and us um, as a, a humanity. So, as you see, this defense victim or private accusation is defending uh, victims, NGOs and personalities, and also public institutions. Institutions. And we presented the lawsuit in year uh, 95, uh, in year 2005, sorry. And then we did three years of of continuous investigation before the Spanish judge. In our system, we have uh, mostly an inquisitorial system uh, that is a little bit corrected by your system, by accusatory system. Uh, uh, but mostly, we have a judge, what we call instruction judge, that investigates with independence uh, at the same time, working together with the state prosecutor and the attorney that represents all these people. But it's the leading, it's the person who decides, and it's one, only sole one person, that decides the legal decisions in the procedure about the first phase of investigation. And that's what we did. We brought. Um, victims, we brought uh, witnesses, we brought um, experts, we brought documents. And um, at, uh, after these three years, and I'm going to show you first uh, the original in, in Spanish, uh, the judge decided that a first phase was concluded, that he had sufficient elements that allowed to affirm somehow that there was a criminal responsibility uh, about these crimes that were uh, investigated. And here we have the, uh, this decision, which is 21st of January 2008. I show you that in, um, in Spanish, which this is the original. And now I show you that 
translated into English. As I did this morning, uh, I think it's interesting to uh, read very briefly these lines because su it summarizes a little bit what it has been these investigations. And it says, the criminal offenses, well, so article, the present preliminary proceedings, so it's preliminary proceeding, it's something similar what is being done, for instance, in, in the International Criminal Court now. You know that the International Criminal Court uh, has four cases, uh, especially in Congo, in Central Africa, uh, in Uganda, and in Sudan. Only uh, Sudan was, has been decided by a decision of the Security Council. The other cases is the self-country that deciding that they have no will or no capacity to, um, to provide investigation and judgment about these international crimes, they ask International Criminal Court to uh, investigate. In that case, we have these pre preliminary proceedings the same. Audiencia Nacional, you see there, Juzgado Central de Instrucción Número 4 of the Audiencia Nacional, that is the same court, it's a national court, which allows to investigate international crimes. Maybe you remember what happened with Pinochet, the Pinochet case, uh, the alleged or the dictatorship in, in Chile, and he was there not because he was a dictatorship or he put away Allende, but he was alleged responsible of uh, more than 3,000 uh, killings in uh, in uh, in his uh, ac activities after taking power. So this is the same court and uh, not the same judge. That was Judge Garzón, that Baltasar Garzón, and this is Judge Andreu. And it says, I continue, pursuant to the lawsuit filed by Procurator Mr. Jose Jose Luis Ferrer Recuero. I also explained that a little bit. This is a, a new f figure for, for you, a new role for you that you don't have in your system probably. is uh, someone that represents the person, the people, before court. You have the attorney, which is the responsible of defense, defense, legal defense, technical defense, and someone who represents you in court. So anything that is being notified to the, to the parties is being notified through the procurator. On, beha on behalf and representing uh, Josep Valmajoy Sala and at least 30 additional plaintiffs, I show you uh, these plaintiffs, some of them, of them against, this was one of, of the military, Colonel Charles Musitu, and at least 40 additional defendants. And it says, it summarizes like that. The criminal offenses filed in the complaint present a wide catalog of criminal activities as follows. Allegedly, a heavily armed and organized politically military group trained and equipped uh, by foreign powers started its criminal activities on October 1st 90 in Uganda, as you see, this first period is covered, which is not covered by International Tribunal uh, Court of Rwanda, from where it departed towards Rwanda. The group undertook a series of different organized and systematic practices toward the extermination of the civil population, both by initiating war hostilities openly and by organizing terrorist attacks of varying ma magnitude which were perpetrated primarily in the northern part of Rwanda. These acts were carried out under a stable, structured, and strongly hierarchical command, which was strategically organized, and which later went to, on to, this, to seize power by armed force, and through the later, arrogated itself an official state role. Establishing a reign of terror, setting up an organized structure of crime alongside the state. In this role, it set out to perpetrate acts of abduction, torture, terrorist attacks, 
imprisonment, selective assassination, destruction, and different forms of elimination of corpses, indiscriminate attacks on the civil population through armed action carried out openly in their own country, Rwanda, as implemented in the neighboring country at the time Zaire, which is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. So, as you see, it summarizes a little bit the investigation. Uh, of course, this uh, is uh, huge. And there are many, many, many details. Uh, but it makes references, one of the things, for instance, which curiously is not being studied in the International Tribunal Court of Rwanda. And this is a, a very important report uh, of a national, a North American national, uh, which name is Robert Gersony, who was working for the UN agency and who was uh, studying what happened the three months after the Rwandan Patriotic Army took power, seized power uh, in, in Rwanda. And in fact, that was to consider whether or not the people of the surroundings, the refugees surrounding uh, Rwanda, were allowed, the situation allowed them to go back to their country or not. And the work was not finished, but uh, the report was, was delivered, uh, and the responsible at that moment of the peace operations was Kofi Annan. He was under Secretary General, and himself, together with Robert Gersony, delivered that information to the Rwandan government. We had that witness uh, before a court, and, and that witness at that moment was the then Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Rwanda, who left the country also. And he said, uh, he explained how this uh, um, report, this Gersony report, was explaining uh, how in three provinces of Rwanda after they took power, at least 30,000 people of civil population were massively killed, mainly Hutu people. Uh, and this is not being investigation, I investigated in the, in the court uh, of Arusha. Very systematically, for you to understand, what was the focus of uh, of the lawsuit and what is the focus of the decision of the, of the court. We often use the image of the iceberg in conflicts. So here at the top, we could see mostly the nine Spanish people for us, in this case, which in a way at least was here <laughs> in the surface eh? because uh, for us, it was very visible, but for the Arusha Tribunal, it was not really visible. In part because they were not interested in the first case, which was under their competence, and the other cases were out of competence. But then, we have here the Rwandese and the Congolese victims. And this was very important because, just to give you some examples, this priest, uh, who disappeared the 26th, uh, in a way witnesses, witnessed a massive killing that took place no more than one kilometer away of his home in a football stadium where during night uh, mm, refugees, IDP, international dis uh, uh, displaced people from war, were gathered inside the, uh, the stadium and they were systematically killed by AK-47. And uh, this was heard by him, and, uh, and of course he knew mm, uh, what happened there, and he was kidnapped three days later. Or here, uh, the three doctors of the world, the same. Um, in fact, they were in a risky area, and uh, when they were delivering some drugs uh, to some um, health centers, local health centers, one, of one victim of one killing that took place the day before said, please, can you assist some uh, people that are 
uh, wounded what they did. And they uh, moved uh, in that area, which was followed by the Secret Services of Rwanda. And because uh, one of, uh, of the, per the, the persons was having a camera, they were fearing that these images were going out of Rwanda. And we had, in fact, one witnesses, one protected uh, witness, 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 that uh, he was, as military of the Rwandan Patriotic Army, present in the, in the, in the meeting where they decided to kill the three doctors of the world. And he explained to the judge what was the real strategy to kill these three people, because other NGOs were attacked, but only these three people were killed. And at the same time, the real huge strategy was to, uh, to wipe completely uh, uh, the international observers of the west part, uh, where, northwest part of, of Rwanda, so that they could continue to attack the eastern part of Congo. And what is most important, to continue the plunder of the mineral resources, natural resources that were placed exactly in the same area where the re refugees were. We have to think about that, and this is very important, because in this eastern part of, of Congo is one of the wealthiest part of, uh, of Africa in natural resources. And we have different types of, uh, of uh, minerals. We have gold, uh, they have uh, uh, diamonds, and they have uh, copper, and they have uh, other type of uh, rare uh, minerals. One of it, maybe you have heard of it, which is coltan, which is a combination of columbine and tantalite, and is used mainly in our uh, mobile phones, in our laptops, uh, in our um, MP3s, and, 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 and all this kind of stuff. It's highly conductive, and it's also used in intelligent um, armament and in satellites and uh, this kind of stuff. And this coincide, uh, this area coincides uh, with the expansion of the mobile phones uh, and the computers and everything. So this was highly required. So this is also investigated. And this is considered by the judge uh, upon our request as plunder but as a war crime of plunder, of nat natural resources. And in fact, we, uh, we have had some sp special witnesses who had explained with a lot of detail while they were killing massively civil population and the refugees, they were by night with trucks uh, carrying the coltan, the minerals, the diamonds, uh, one, one uh, very concrete uh, explain, I didn't explain that the, this morning, uh, how he, w he witnessed it, three flights a week of things like that, full of diamonds, uh, three times, three times a week. Imagine uh, how much money was in each of that uh, flight. And this flight was uh, directly to Rwanda and uh, as this person, uh, uh, in a way, witnessed it, was carried out di directly uh, to the surroundings of the president of, of Rwanda uh, residence. So as you see, there are different types of, uh, of, uh, of crimes. And to end a little bit with that explanation, uh, after this decision that I'm, I'm showing here, uh, the judge decided to indict, uh, for the first time, 40 high-ranking officials of uh, the current uh, government of Rwanda. This is for the first time also in, in, in Spain, because for the previous uh, cases, th that was people that were highly responsible, but were not currently uh, in power. But for these 40 people, which uh, president of Rwanda was included, in, as indicted, uh, President Paul Kagame, uh, he at the same time issued international arrest uh, warrant uh, against 40 people 
not including President Kagame as a sitting president, considering that the national court uh, is not allowed, and this is a debate, but primarily is not allowed to uh, uh, issue an arrest warrant uh, against the sitting president. So we got to know that this decision of the Spanish court was delivered to the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Uh, as you see, transmission of official document received from Madrid, Spain, in response to ICTR uh, note verbal date 18 March two, uh, 2008 and reference. Uh, so one case, uh, either, I don't know exactly who, ex who requested that, either if it was, uh, I'm almost sure that was a defense lawyer. Uh, but I'm not quite uh, <laughs> positive. Uh, but that's uh, why uh, the Arusha, Arusha Tribunal asked and requested the, the Spanish court to deliver that decision to, uh, to uh, the court to know about, I suppose, the investigation specially focalized and focused in year 94. And here we have um, the tr official uh, translation uh, of uh, the, uh, this decision. And here uh, it's uh, 180 pages. We're not going to read it, of course. But in, in synthesis, uh, it stated the alleged responsibility of these current uh, high-ranking officials and issuing international arrest uh, uh, warrant uh, against them. And uh, very lastly, this uh, last month, to give you some examples, among these 40 people, some of them, they were occupying key posts even e uh, before the UN. We localized, for instance, one person who was highly responsible, who was the chief of the military intelligence uh, until the month of March 97. So under his responsibility, uh, the three doctors of the world were killed. And not only these three doctors of the world, but also civil population in Rwanda, and also some UN agency uh, staff, and also a Canadian priest who was killed uh, 10 days later. So in a context of one month, one month and a half, they killed a lot of people, not only Rwandan. So under his responsibility, uh, these people were killed. And at the moment that uh, the uh, Spanish judge issued this international arrest warrant, uh, he was occupying, uh, the de uh, he was deputy director of the UNAMID force in Sudan, who was supposed to prevent another genocide in Sudan. But he was responsible, alleged responsible, of international crimes in Rwanda. So uh, this was one of the main things that we tried to, uh, to do. We asked uh, through uh, the international agencies that at least UN uh, doesn't renew his, uh, his agreement. Uh, I have to say, I didn't say that uh, in the morning. But uh, while this had to be decided in September 2008, at the end of uh, September 2008, the first week of September of 2008, there was a trip, and that was public uh, in the website of the State Department. Uh, the State Department delivered uh, a huge amount of money to this uh, unit. Uh, in, in Sudan, commanded by this uh, military, as a way, of course, uh, knowing that the president of Rwanda at that moment had pressured, saying that if that person is not confirmed in, in his post, uh, all the Rwandese troops, who were the second force in Sudan, will go back uh, to Rwanda and will leave the place. So at the end of the month, it was confirmed by UN Secretary General, uh, but I think in, a, in, in some diplomatic, intelligent way, saying, "Okay, I confirm him, 
but I ask the Rwandan government that in six months term I would need another candidate which is not on the list, which they did. Um, and uh, he was not confirmed six months later. And uh, to give you another example, another person who was indicted was um, another general who was deployed as an ambassador of Rwanda in New Delhi, India. And uh, of course there was a, a debate whether he had or not immunity and, uh, and so that. Uh, but in the last month, uh, he was called back to, to Rwanda to a meeting. And after that meeting, we don't know exactly what happened in that meeting, but he left the country. He went to Uganda and then to South Africa. And he is now in South Africa. And we are now asking to South Africa, to the government of South Africa, please execute the international arrest warrant that you have here in, in Interpol. We have uh, in the following months um, the uh, World Cup of football, which is supposed to play with fair play. So we ask also fair play in human rights uh, <laughs> area. But uh, that's a little bit uh, uh, the situation that we are on it. And to give you, uh, because it's late and I know that uh, you have many things to do, but to to give uh, at least some very short perspective about the international, the other initiative that we are leading, uh, the international dialogue that we are uh, facilitating somehow. In the middle of this procedure, this investigation, some victims were saying uh, justice is very important. And many agree that uh, peace is not possible really if some justice, if not some justice is provided. But some of these victims were also agreeing that maybe justice was not sufficient. So something more had to be done. And they proposed to start a dialogue process, which was started by two people, in fact. And then they asked us to facilitate a first meeting in year 2004. And this was in Spain. Ten people were assisting. Hutu and Tutsi coming from different countries, all refugees at that moment. Then we had a second meeting, important meeting in, in Barcelona in 2006, where 20 people were uh, assisting. And for the first time, people coming from, from the regime in Rwanda, uh, so not only refugees at that moment. Uh, and we had some um, different pa platforms of dialogue from that moment. The first platform, in, in, in fact, was in your country, in, in Washington, D.C., in the George Mason University. And we had like uh, 23 people coming, Rwandese people coming from United States and Canada. And then we had another meeting in, in the Netherlands, another meeting in France, another meeting of uh, women, another meeting with Congolese. And then last year in 2009, we had a representative edition we had also high-ranking people because we had uh, in that process two former prime ministers, various former ministers, various former ambassadors, former military people, uh, human rights activists, economists, uh, and of course uh, victims and scholars and, and other um, grassroots uh, people, let's say like that. But at the end, we had this representative edition, and that's their goal to achieve and to arrive someday to a national dialogue, because they are not only studying what happened in the past, which is very important, but presently and very specially, they are studying what could be done from now on, especially studying from uh, some generations for the future. And there is, in these kind of meetings, a very interesting uh, future proposals for, for their country. And that's their dream, uh, to have someday um, a kind of national dialogue that brings uh, the desired um, democracy and uh, justice and peace for, for their country. So with that uh, words, uh, I, I try to give uh, 
a short perspective of uh, a huge uh, uh, conflict and uh, huge uh, initiative, but I'm here for you to share whatever you might m I be interested uh, to share. Thank you very much. So now it's your turn. <laughs> Any questions? I, I, mean, I think it's a huge victory, and I think that the ICTR requesting the documents from the Spanish court is important. Um, and I know you have speculation as to why they requested them. Um, since they're so limited in the scope that they're allowed to look at, um, so I have some questions about that. I mean, whether you think that they will use what you found maybe to bring to prosecute the people within the time frame that, that they're allotted. But my, my, I guess my question is, of the 40 people that they put these international arrest warrants out, is, has anybody, has any of these people been taken into custody? Or, or is it more just a formality that they have found that they are um, liable for these crimes? This is a very quick question, really. Um, and I, I, I'll try to give you two examples. Um, I was speaking in the middle of year 94 about this bishop and religious killing, for instance. Uh, in that decision, uh, in some pages, it is described, according to some witnesses, how these bishops were killed and um, who were the main responsible of, of that killing. So this is really under the competence of the Rwandan tribunal the ICTR. And um, in fact, we had the confirmation that at least from year 2002, the ICTR was investigated that crime. So they had investigated that crime. Once that uh, this decision was made public, uh, it was, I think, one month later, that for the first time, the general prosecutor of the ICTR before the Security Council in New York, ask for the first time to open a file against the Rwandan Patriotic Army, saying we are going, we are investigating a crime, and we are going to open a file, and we are asking to open a file. It didn't pass one week that the General Prosecutor of Rwanda um, said, "No, no problem. ICTR will manage it." And they ask to uh, investigate and prosecute, and they ask not to continue the investigations, and that, that's what they did. So they started to control it in the national jurisdiction, and at the end, they condemned um, two soldiers, and they acquitted two high responsibles. They were not all the high responsibles that were uh, quoted in the Spanish resolution. And in fact, um, uh, this has been uh, really disputed by Human Rights Watch, for instance, uh, saying this was not really fair and, and whatever. But this was really a way to control. So the first time that the ICTR expressed the will to investigate the crimes of the other side, uh, they achieved in less than one week to control that uh, uh, process. And I'm going to give another example also. Uh, we know that um, Carla de Ponte, which was the, the general prosecutor of the both tribunals, uh, was investigating uh, some crimes, including these bishop and religious uh, people uh, crimes, but some other crimes also. And uh, in fact, she had the will to prosecute them. She had the elements of crime of the, of the investigation to prosecute them. And in fact, there were some important <coughs> meetings uh, that uh, she held with important personalities. And she explains that in the book. So it's something that it's uh, public and I can speak about. And she explains how in year 2002, she attended a meeting in the State Department with uh, Rwandan authorities, high Rwandan authorities, 
where this issue was discussed. And at the end, because there was no agreement, um, <coughs> uh, Richard Prosper, which is the special ambassador for international crimes and former uh, prosecutor of the ICTR, presented, that's what she explains, presented a document, uh, a proposal of document of agreement, uh, asking, in the name of the State Department, to deliver all this uh, investigation and all these evidences to the National Court of Rwanda so this can be continued in the, in the National Court. And uh, Carla del Ponte said, I'm sorry, but uh, I'm not going to sign that agreement. And uh, what she says in that, in that book is uh, that one hour later, I was explaining that uh, to Professor Webster, one hour later, she received a call from Richard Prosper saying, you're out of ICTR as a prosecutor, and you will be out in two year time uh, in the ICTY. So in a way, um, just to show with these two little examples how extremely e even impossible is to uh, bring some kind of investigation of the non-official uh, guilty people in that, in that, uh, uh, in that court, which is really sad, uh, because uh, uh, it, it was, in a way, another attempt of the uh, international justice to bring some kind of justice. And if we see the the statue of, uh, especially of the of the Rwanda tribunal, the main thing, the main idea, is this has to provide justice, but in order to provide some sort of reconciliation among the population, which in a way um, the results are uh, <laughs> at least disputable. I have one quick follow-up and then I'll talk something else and not do it. Um, yeah, <laughs> we have plenty um, of time. So, you know, you said that the UN Criminal Court now has four cases that it's basically looking at, Sudan and the other one. But um, do you think, since the ICTR is so limited, and since you do have this case, I mean, do you have any plan on, since you have this judgment brought down in the Spanish court, of trying to approach the UN criminal court system about looking outside the one-year window that the ICTR has and possibly bringing it before the court with this, with this ruling that you have to look at the, the span of time that you're talking about, or is that just... It's also interest, an interesting question. In fact, this decision covers uh, now, yeah. uh, from 1st October 19, but we stopped, and I put here 2002. Oh. In, in fact, we stopped very consciously in the 1st July 2002, knowing that when we presented the lawsuit in, in year 2005, uh, there was a case about uh, Republic, uh, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. So we were, in a way, uh, showing that we wanted to uh, respect uh, so much the, the, the work of the ICC and also the will of the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, delivering that to, um, to the ICC. But in fact, um, it's true that in the proceedings we are receiving some kind of evidences which are uh, of year 2003, 2004, which are under the competence of the ICC. So we are at that moment, they're not very huge and very solid evidences. There are some witnesses that have declared about that, especially also about the plundering and the war crime of, of plunder. But uh, we are very uh, attentive of, of what is the proceeding and the result of the first case of the ICC. As you know, there are two cases. Um, and uh, this is going very slowly. And the indictment uh, is really in the surface of the conflict. I would say uh, uh, it's a child um, uh, enrollment. Uh, a, a soldier, something like that, which is, I'm not saying this, that, this didn't exist, but I wouldn't say that's the key thing of what happened or the key crimes that happened really in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So we are very attentive of what they are doing. 
and uh, and of course uh, this could be a way um, according even to the Spanish law to deliver these kind of evidences to the uh, ICC to see if there there is any possibility uh, of pursuing that but we are really worried uh, about what's going on in the ICC right now uh, yeah. <laughs> we're really worried because even we have to say that there are many people that were involved in the ICTR that are going now to the ICC so the practices that are being uh, transferred as in somehow and we are really worried uh, there because um, we I think most of, of the lawyers in the international community want a fair trial uh, for the suspects and knowing that the ICC for the first time in history uh, allows the victims to be represented legally in the proceedings the, we also want uh, a fair trial for the victims so uh, but I, I probably knowing that this is the first proceedings they wanted to do it very solid and very undisputable that at the end they have uh, one decision that is undisputable and they probably don't want to leak uh, really very deep in the conflict. That's my perception. I can be wrong, but that's my perception. Thanks. Yeah. About what happened on the ground, did um, most of the refugees come back to Rwanda? And if they have, what's stopping in fact these are two questions which are very very interesting too uh, this is a disputed issue what happened exactly in year 96 in the first war and this bombing bombing of the refugee camps some uh, consider that uh, almost and a half of the refugees returned back we're talking about around half million people but no more uh, then what happened to the other people we are trying to investigate and what we have to say that numbers doesn't coincide we are talking uh, different sources are talking about between 200,000 and 400,000 that were killed in this one year one year and a half uh, violent conflict I'm talking just Rwandan people uh, and there are still many people in in the forest Rwandan people living still in the forest some disguised as Congolese uh, we have to say that I in Eastern Congo there are Hutu people that are Congolese also because the, um, this was separated in the colonization and decolonization but uh, they, there was a, a whole land there uh, and they were sharing um, of course many things and territory of course so it's very difficult to know and this is the uh, traditional pretext of the current uh, army of Rwanda to be present since the year 96 in Rwanda in in Democratic Republic of Congo in fact uh, I don't know if you remember and this happens every time uh, it, it, just to you to, to 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 understand this first war happened in October 96 just days before uh, re-election of Clinton US uh, elections and we had exactly the same episodes just before the elections of Barack Obama just exactly the same we, we saw the same images thousands of thousands of refugees that were escaping massive attacks uh, and that was at that moment uh, 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 an alleged um, uh, rebel uh, who knows if it's, he is Rwandan or Congolese? Um, probably he's he's Rwandan, but he he has also uh, Congolese nationality, named Nkunda Nkunda Batware, and he's now for other purposes he's now in prison in Rwanda, and uh, and the Congo wants him 
extradite uh, to, to Congo. So same kind of episodes that mm. happened in, in Eastern Congo. And the problem is that uh, many Rwandans are worried that this could happen again in Rwanda. We have to think about that this has not really been settled, that one huge community is all considered as genociders and criminals, and this is Hutu. And the, the country is ruled by a political military um, party or, let's say, army at the same time uh, that belongs to the minority Tutsi that con con continues to oppress uh, the people. And this is not only my consideration, but you, you could visit The Economist or you could visit the Freedom House or, or whatever other international organizations or even, lastly, Human Rights Watch, who, who was uh, at the beginning not so uh, critical uh, with, with the regime. So in a way, it's a huge tense situation right now in Rwanda. And we have to consider that in August 10th, uh, Rwanda has new elections for uh, for presidency, and the people that are trying to rule as an opposition party, they're o both or being brought to prison or under investigation. They they just don't let them register the, the the political party. So every initiative that uh, could allow some kind of oxygen. Uh, to that regime is oppressed immediately. So it's a kind of a, a, of a very tension uh, situation that uh, um, if we do nothing, uh, international community will face again somehow. So I thank you very much for your attention and your presence and uh, hope you continue with the, the, the excellent uh, teachings of <laughs> Professor uh, Webster. We, we offer you our sincerest thanks for coming to visit us and we wish you the very best of luck with the uh, continuation of your very important work. Thanks uh, so thank much. Thank you thanks. very much. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. Thank you, Mr. Thank you.